Hey guys, welcome to the show today. And I think today we're in for a fun surprise, right? How do you go from somebody being an NFL player to somebody who we're interviewing as a um, STR, basically short-term rentals, Airbnb's uh, expert. So uh, Mark Ben, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's from one school of hard knocks to another. Another, right? Okay. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about football, right? I'm the least uh, person to know. But I mean, th- I've been dying to ask you this question, which sure. is, so yesterday, I guess there was the NFL draft, right? Mm-hmm. And you see people getting all these big contracts, right? Multi-million dollar contracts. I mean, today, you know, the, some of the top players are getting hundreds of millions of dollars, literally, right? What happens, man? I mean, because who did you number one play for? I'm sorry, say that again. So, so who did you NFL, play for in the NFL? So I played, I got drafted. Now I got drafted in the eighth round. They don't even have eight rounds anymore. So they, uh-huh. so um, I got drafted in the eighth round by the Miami Dolphins. Okay. And okay. Um, I went there and I played there for seven years. And mm-hmm. uh, so by, by that point, um, the, the signing bonus was uh, um, barely in the five, five, uh, the five digits as, as okay. opposed to these big million dollar contracts. And I played a yeah. long time ago. So, I mean, the money has continued to get better. Um, I know when I started playing, they the old guys that when I was playing were amazed at how much money we were making as well. So right. it's just part of the evolution. So I have, a, I mean, this is something that's fascinating, right? The public always says, "Hey, uh, what happens to people that are basketball players, NFL players?" Um, what I mean, you know, people in the business, right? Because this is, I mean, and this is from a audience curiosity, my own curiosity, man. Uh, most guys have never seen that kind of money. I mean, I've never seen hundreds right. of millions of dollars, right? A few million is a different thing, but, um, and we have had to earn it, right? That's very different. It takes mm-hmm. time. What happens, man? I mean, somebody makes that kind of money. I mean, that's like right. hitting a lottery jackpot, right? You know, uh, it, it's interesting because from, you know, I can tell you from, even from my own perspective, from the time when you start playing sports and from the time you're eight, nine, 10 years old, you start getting treated differently because you're a better athlete and you're pushed into more and more situations. And right. as you continue to excel, you know, the rewards are getting, it will get better and better. So, you know, I, for me, I got to go to college on a scholarship right. today. Right. The, today, the guys are making money playing college football. Right. Um, and then, and, and then you get into the pros and you're, you're making some really good money. And uh, along the way, because you're, you've been told sort of you're better, you're treated a little bit differently. And you also have people whispering in your ear. um, That's, that's part of the downfall at the other side. It comes so quickly and so easily doing something that really God blessed you with um, to get that kind of money. And the, the, the reality of it is, you know, in the NFL, the average career is 3.2 years. So if you have a great career, like I said, I, I played for 10 years, um, I had what I considered a pretty, a pretty long career, but it still seems like it comes to an end at the, all of a sudden, you know, you typically, you don't get to choose when your last game is somebody else right. chooses that for you. Right. So what was it, how did you end up uh, in real estate, right. Uh, from the NFL career? What did you kind of, what was your switch like? You know what I, um, I was interested in early on and I just, I didn't take action on my interest to be very honest with you. So it was something that I was sort of in the education piece for a long time. And, um, and then I, um, I, I um, finally took action. Um, I, I, I stumbled into a situation where I had the opportunity to wholesale a house. Okay. And, um, and actually, I believe that's the first time I ever met you, Andrew, was that you came and looked at that house in Arlington Heights. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, so I stumbled into an opportunity and I was like, gosh, that's, that was kind of cool. I made a little bit of money. I, you know, I, I never really did much with it. And I, and I made a little bit of money, um, which prompted me to say, how am I going to find some more of these? So I, I, I wandered down the road of, of, you know, finding um, wholesale houses basically and fixing them up and, and reselling them or, or, or just wholesaling them to another investor. I did that for so a number st- of years. So you started with wholesales, then you did some fix and flips, mm-hmm. and then you owned rental properties at one time also. I did. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we had uh, we had bought and uh, some of the some of the properties we bought we turned into rentals. Um, we uh, my wife inherited some, so 
Um, we we were running, you know, probably we had 12, 15 doors that we at one point we were running as far as uh, vacation or not vacation rentals, but long term rentals. Yeah. Um, and but my and you know at the time my bread and butter really was uh, fix and flips, and I got to a place where I wasn't I wasn't happy with what I was finding, and at the other end I couldn't sell it for what I wanted to sell it for, and you know I scratched my head. Um, I went out to San Diego to go to a mastermind type of meeting. And, um, and my wife said, well, I'll come with you. So instead of staying at the hotel, we stayed at an Airbnb. And I was like, there's this thing called Airbnb. Like, I, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. And we went and stayed on the beach and had a great time. So I'm like, well, I need to find out a little bit more about this business. And so that's, that's, that's really was the original seed for me to, to come back and, and, and start my very first Airbnb to see if, to see if it would work the way, the way I thought it would. Got it. And uh, as far as um, like I call a lot of the stuff that you're doing, a lot of the stuff like what I have in Florida, you're managing that, right? We're mm -hmm. building a lot more for you to manage. Um, I call those boring Airbnbs, right? <laughs> and yeah. most people think about exotic Airbnbs, like to me, uh, anything on the beach, in the mountains, uh, quote unquote, a tourist destination. To me, I categorize that as an air, as a exotic uh, short-term rentals. Did you always, because you started, you lived in a exotic uh, Airbnb, as we would call it, right? Where you went to the beach. And then um, was there a transition that I'm going to basically go after a lot of the boring stuff? What does that look like today for you? You know what? I actually started, um, my first Airbnb was in Libertyville. And you okay. know who the heck wants to go stay in Libertyville? Right. Um, my favorite, my favorite story, and and it really is one of the things I kind of tell people is like build it and they will come. My, um, I had a flip in Westchester, Illinois, that I couldn't sell, and my wife said, "Well, let's turn it into an Airbnb." And I remember very distinctly asking her, "Well, who the heck would want to come stay in Westchester, Illinois, in an Airbnb?" Right. Right. Honestly, for the six months that we had it, it was one of our best Airbnbs. Um, right. And and so I, there's. There's a demand for this type of accommodation, whether it's exotic at the beach. And um, I had the good fortune of I moved, you know, I moved down to Florida about a year and a half ago to to be closer to these ones down here. Um, but whether it's in suburban America or even in you know urban urban sites, uh, there's there's a demand. The important thing for that there is understanding who your who your customer is and who you're trying to serve. And that makes all the rest of the decisions as far as how to, you know, what, how to furnish and everything makes that, makes that easy. So, um, so yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's, there's different segments in this, in this market. And, you know, and the interesting part is this, right? There are two businesses here. One is the hospitality side of it, which is the hospitality management of this business. And one is the real estate business, right? And right. I genuinely, and I'd love to get your take on it because I'm a real estate guy. Right. I'm not a management guy on the hospitality side. And a lot of times, um, you know, people blur the lines. Understand you have two businesses if you're going to do it on your own. Right. Mm -hmm. For me, oh, yeah. um, you know, I'm like, hey, man, Mark, you manage the hospitality side of the business. Right. And then I will manage the real estate side of it, meaning buying the property, whether it's building new, whether it's basically getting it up to par and then turning it over to you. Um, and a lot of times, I mean, whenever I see YouTube videos, whenever I see that, I don't think people understand that. And when people get into trouble is that they don't understand that there's two distinct sides and you can screw up either one. Would that be a right assessment of breaking it down a little bit? I think absolutely. There's definitely two different businesses because, because I, you know, I've focused on running the hospitality side. Um, and consequently, I haven't had to pay as attention, pay as much attention to the number side of the real estate. And that's an right. important part of it. Right. How you acquire it, how you finance it, you know, that that's huge. Um, but what I get to do is on the on the um, accommodation or the hospitality side is I get to try to make sure that I focus on maximizing your revenue right. and at the same time getting the kind of reviews that allow us to charge a premium on our places. Um, and that comes from, and, and I always joke that the timeline changes. So like when I was a long-term um, man or your manager, when I had my own long-term rentals, my timeline, if I had a guest or if I had a, a tenant ask me something, if I I solved the problem within, you know, within a week, then I, I did a really good job, you know, on the hospitality side, it's, it's minutes and hours, you know, and, right. and so I mean, it's, it's one of those things, right, you know, you, 
go, you're in a hotel room, let's just suppose, and the coffee maker is not working, right? I mean, you're irritated, right? I mean, right. listen, sometimes it doesn't work, right? But we have all been there. Oh, I ran out of coffee. I'm pissed off, right? I mean, and yep. there's no reason, really. I mean, if you look, really look at it, <laughs> there's no reason. We all have done that. But, you know, you ex your expectation Right. Whenever you're at a hotel, oh, my key doesn't work. How the damn? I mean, it's such a really relatively small yeah. thing, but you go down get a new key and that's that, right? right. Uh, it's it's different, right? And here yes. you're kind of between a tenant and you're between a hotel. You're somewhere in between, but you're paying for an experience, right? Which is yep. very, very different, right? You're not necessarily renting a hotel room. You're renting an experience, really, which is mm -hmm. a different way of looking at it. And and I'd like to break that down even further. Like if I go, let's say in the mountains and I have a log cabin uh, that I'm renting, I'm paying a premium uh, in most cases to have that, right? And which is fine. Right. So then I want the experience to go with it. Meaning if I go and turn on the gas grill, I want the damn thing to work, right? Work, I can't yeah. have it out of gas, right? Which is very, it's not a big deal. Okay, go maybe five miles away, pick up a, a you know, cylinder of gas, uh, right? And exchange it, whatever. But I don't want to have that. That I right. can, right? It's You're on just vacation, one of those things. Right? Yeah. You're yeah. on vacation. You don't want to have to go do that. Sure, you right. can. Right. And so um, that's one of the things that we've worked really hard at is um, in our um, in our process to try to be very, very proactive, right? right? To check the gas, right? Check to make sure that the code's working that um, so that it goes really, really smoothly, right? right. The, the best, the best case scenario is I never hear from the guests because my communication right. has told them everything that they need to know, everything worked, and then they left, and I never heard from them. That's right. a that's a great, you know, that's a great situation. Right. Basically, it's like a touch point, right? It's the less the touch points, the more convenient it is, and you're answering the question for the guest before they even ask it. Hey, right. what's going to be my code? Because if I sent you the code or the access five days ago. With the amount of emails we all get, with the amount of text messages we all get, we're going to forget. We're not going to be able to find it, right? These are just basic things, but yet that yield to a certain type of a customer experience. And you can be the greatest real estate guy, yet fail in hospitality management, and you can be great at hospitality management and fail at real estate, right? right. Uh, and, and a lot of times people are like, oh, how difficult is that? Guys, listen. For anything to do at scale and do it well, there's a skill set, right? And pe and you can be good at either or and do very, very well. So uh, let me go back. Like, I mean, I remember Bill, um, you know, our mutual friend Bill is who kind of reintroduced me to you. Um, you had rented one of his two flats, right? Which was basically a arbitrage that you did. Was that your initial strategy when early on you and your wife started in terms of getting into the business was the whole arbitrage uh, part of the Airbnbs? Yes. That's so that's, that's where we started with, uh, was with rent arbitrage to, you know, in full disclosure to the bill, I said, Hey, this is what I'm going to do with it. I think Bill told me I was crazy, but okay, I'll, I'll let you sign a lease. Um, and we furnished it and then rented it out. Right. It's no different than buying a case of water at Costco making it cold and selling it on a hot day for a buck, you know, buck a bottle. And when you bought right. the whole case for four, right. So, right. Right. um, and, and, and that, that worked out really, really well for me. Uh, the next one that, that Bill brought me at that point, he had seen the success that we had and said, basically said, Hey, I've got another one, but instead of signing a lease, what I want to do is I, I want to basically partner with you and do revenue share. And, and so we've, we've kind of, we've continued in that direction. So I, so some, some degrees, um, I, I, in that case, I kind of stumbled on the, the co-hosting model whereby um, we do revenue, we, I do revenue share with, with the, with the real estate side of the equation, which is you guys, which is Bill and other investors that actually own property. Got it. So today, what does your business look like? You move down to Marco Island. You're still managing properties up in uh, Chicago market. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. We manage uh, we manage about 35 properties right now in the Chicago market. Okay. We manage another 40 or so from Bradenton down to Marco Island. Okay. And then we then we have another 20, 25 just sort of spread around the country. Got it. Okay. So uh, that's kind of the cool part about this, right? That you can manage this pretty much anywhere if you have your systems down. Would that be uh, yeah. the right way to put it? Okay. Got it. Yeah. And, so, and we and we really built it from the very beginning 
to not necessarily have to have boots on the ground anywhere we went, as long as we could develop, you know, relationships with a couple key vendors and all of our, um, all of our systems we needed to be on the internet. So as long as we have an internet signal, we can, we can manage it from wherever we are. Got it. So um, in terms of when you made that switch, right, which is now, hey, I'm going to run a, I'm a service provider, I'm a, a kind of a vendor partner, whatever you want to call that, uh, to a person that owns some properties. Uh, was that like kind of what happened in business? Or was that a active choice you and your wife made that, hey, we're going to not necessarily buy more properties, we're going to go ahead and make this a business? Well, for, for us, we, we like the fact that we were moving more into a cash flow business, you know, and, and, and as opposed to flipping houses. So that we, that was a big part of it. Um, and yes, it's something that we, we evolved to, and we, we were really looking for a little bit more of cash flow side of it. Um, the one thing that we didn't have built out early on was um, sort of the outward facing, how are we going to find more, more owners to grow our business? Uh, and we had a, we had, I had a mutual friend introduce me to my business partner who um, just so happened the early part of his business was built out as finding new people. So Got it. it was a good match. Got it. Okay. So whenever you're basically doing this, right, in terms of arbitrage, because arbitrage is something that has been usually popular, right? It's been uh, promoted heavily with any YouTube videos and all this kind of stuff. Give right. me the good and the bad, because you're a, uh, I mean, whenever I think of you, I think of you of a business person, you just happen mm -hmm. to provide a service, but uh, you're a pretty well thought out business person, right? Um, so you've seen both sides of it, right? The good yep. and the bad. So what is the real truth? I mean, uh, a lot of times, oh my God, you can make all this money doing rental arbitrage. Talk to me when things go right, it's great, right? You made a lot of money with the rental arbitrage, but what happens, man, if there's damage? What happens if your occupancy rates run low? Um, it, it, do you have any examples of that? Well, so, I mean, the thing with arbitrage, like anything, there's there's risk, right? So right. Um, there is the risk of um, if, and you really have to look at it because there is seasonality to these rentals. So you have to look at what's going to happen over 12 months. Um but if you have too many months where you don't make money and you're loot, you know, your negative cash flow, um, that's that's not good either. So that's right. that's the risk of um, arbitrage. But the the upside of that is because there is some risk, you stand to make more money, right? And right. if you if you're renting the right property in the right, you know, in the right place, and you furnish it the correct way, and you manage it well, you can make a lot of money doing that. He's absolutely no doubt about it. Got it. Um, yeah, I was gonna say just the you know the other side, uh, the other side of it is when you're when you're co-hosting, which is really where our our model is, is full well acknowledged that our upside isn't as big as whether you if you own the property or if you uh, rent arbitrage, right? And and but there's not as much risk there either. Right. And that's what I wanted to kind of touch upon, because I think providing a great service, a lot of times, and this is something I've always believed that, um, you know, a lot of times you can provide a great service, right? Um, and in mastery, I've said this to a lot of people that, hey, listen, if you do HVAC business, right, don't quit your business. Everybody needs HVAC, right? right. In fact, only put HVAC units in three bedroom, one bath type of properties, like simple bread and butter stuff, just do a volume of it, hook up with investors. And instead of doing flips, I promise you, if you run a good business, you'll net out way more money, right? Uh, a lot of times what we think is, oh my God, flipping is the way. It's actually a lot of times it's not. Get good at what you do, do a volume of it, don't go do any specialty products, only do that one thing, which either you're basically fixing the thing. If you're fixing it, it's going to, at some point need to be replaced. You have a built-in customer, right? And it right. just grows each day that becomes your cash flow, and then start stacking properties on the side because really we're all after freedom, right? That's what we want. We want enough money and we want the time on our side, right? And right. a lot of times people, we, in fact, try to get out of our jobs and we get busier right, trying to uh, you know keep our own treadmill running than it was before, right? So I right, see that yeah. a lot happen. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't necessarily want to 
um, uh, you know, do something on the side just to create another job for yourself. Correct. Exactly. Right. But that's a, that's, I think a little bit mature part of the business, which takes a little bit more time to understand because now like with a business like yours, it's a very scalable business, right? If you're managing 80 to manage 120, it doesn't necessarily require that much more staff. Now, if you go no. to 200, maybe it'll require a little bit more staff, but right, it's right. not linear, right? No, so absolutely next, not. So the next part of the question is this, um, that as far as the seasonal differences, let's say in the Chicago market, which is a blah, boring market generally, especially in the suburbs, right? Versus Florida. What do you see the differences in that type of market or other parts of the country where it's a, because Florida market, Chicago market is very, very different. What are the differences that you noticed? You know, one of the things for us that we really like is it's, um, it's counter cyclical for us. So when we're slow in Florida, we're fast in Chicago. Or, um, when we're when we're slow in Chicago, we're fast in Chicago and in, in Florida. So that's been nice. Um, Florida is a little bit longer of a month, a uh, little bit longer of a season. There's nine months where we're we're really busy here. Um, Chicago is a little bit more of a six month, six month, right? With the okay. with the you know the the bumper months being you know not as nice as the as the bumper months in, months in Florida. Um, okay. But that's that's the biggest thing. And and again, the we focus mostly on um, on vacation type of properties in Florida, where properties where people have, have, are coming to um, to escape a little bit. Um, and and so that has um, again that extends our our, our our seasonality, right? So with um, with your properties in Florida, there's still an escape property where people are saying, Hey, it's cold here. Um, geez, I'd like to go to Marco Island, but it's too expensive. Port Charlotte is nice. Right. Know, same thing. I'm close to the beach and, and it's the same weather. Correct. And I'm, uh, these properties are going to be say 10 minutes, 15 minutes from the beach rather than right on the beach, because your scalability 10 or 15 minutes away is going to be a lot more. Right, because right. you can literally buy the land, build a property, refi out, have equity in them, and they'll cash flow 1400 bucks each door. Right, fifteen hundred bucks right. each door. Uh, I'm not talking about it for a duplex. I'm not talking about the whole thing. Each door will cash flow that. Mm -hmm. But this is something interesting in Florida, right? You saw this happen with my property. We had this conversation last six, seven months. Boom, boom, boom. Each month, more money than the month before, right? Every single month. And then yep. uh, come April, boom, zero, zero bookings, yep. right? So I call okay. you, I'm yep. like, hey, man, uh, what's going on here? And then you adjusted a rate and suddenly bookings started coming in again, right? Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about yep. that because that's going to happen. If you don't manage your cash flow well and you just go spend uh, the extra money that you had to 3,000 bucks, if you have one or two properties, then you're gonna basically be in for a hurting. Have you, uh, do you experience that kind of across the board in Florida or is it just unique to my property? No, you know what, so May, the second half of April and May are always gonna be slow here, right? Cause it's not spring break anymore. It's not summer break yet. So those are that's, those are one of our slowest times. Um, and, and there is, so what the other dynamic we're going, we're seeing right now is the change, the travel pattern changing just a little bit where there was a lot of demand because of COVID being over or people having some freedom, we're going back to a little bit more of a normal cycle. And so some of the, some of our dynamic pricing tools are a little bit slow. So like you, like you said, like, Hey, there's nothing. We just bumped it down 10, 12% and all of a sudden it picked back up. Um, right. and so that's something that we see um, often enough um, down here. Um, and, and so then the other balance that we try is because uh, one of the things I do like about short-term rentals is that your properties are always in good shape because the, um, there's somebody in there cleaning it every week, right? right. And when they leave, right. someone cleans it and you can discover if there's, if there's damage or not. When you lower the price too much, then your guest quality goes down. And so that's always, you know, it, it's, it's not a, it's not a science where it's, it's a little bit of an art form. Let's make sure that we are still getting good guests and, and at the same time, maximizing your revenue. Okay. So talk a little bit about uh, problems with guests, right? The first thing we think about, especially in, uh, in some areas, number one is noise monitors. Do you suggest to your owners 
Uh, like, is there a checklist you give to them? Hey, this is your first property. This is kind of the checklist we can give you, uh, be it entry for the doors, be it, uh, you know, something like a noise monitor, uh, be it maybe a closet, which cannot be opened by the guest. So you have all the supplies there. Do you have a checklist like that for your uh, clients that you take on on board? Yeah, we have we have a, a checklist. We have a setup guide that we sort of offer up. Um, uh, part of it is a recommendation on which locks to use and um, which we do recommend noise monitors. That's always a, a good option to, you know, it it, bat, it it combats the three big things you're going to have with vacation rentals or, or short-term rentals is, is noise, parking, and trash, right? And so um, the noise monitor helps us in real time to know if there's an issue going on uh, or we have, um, you know, messaging that goes out to the guests and, and we, we stay we stay on top of that one pretty tightly. Um, trash is another another thing you have to make a consideration for. You typically have to find a service that will come and roll your garbage cans out and roll them back in because it is a residential neighborhood. And, and it's not, again, you don't want to ask the guests to do that. Um, and parking, it's just, you got you to gotta, you know, stay on top of that as much as you can. Um, make so sure that they know here's where you can park and here's where you can't. So it's interesting because on one of my properties now, it just happens to be this was the first model that we built for Florida, right, for mm -hmm. Mastery Elite. And we're building another, what, 80 more are coming out of the ground. Uh, they're already out. They're kind of 5%, 10% between completion at this point. But uh, so Todd and I had this conversation. Todd's like, uh, did you give any direction to Mark? I'm like, listen, man, he has a process. Right. And I'm not going to mess with the process. Right. Whatever Mark is doing, I'm sure he's doing it to the best of his ability. And let me see how that process works before I start putting my two cents in. Right. And it's interesting because you decided and I didn't say anything. You never said anything to me that, hey, no pets allowed. Right. This was right. something that you decided in one of my units. And is there now today a lot of people travel with pets. Right. So that is an in demand item. Is there a reason why you decided that? And I noticed on and I didn't know this. Todd told me about it. He's like, you know, on one of them, you did make an exception. So what's your feeling in general to allow people with pets? I am um, split down the middle on pets. I'm 50 50. So our, our, we have about 50 50 properties that allow pets that don't allow pets um, because there's a good number of people that travel with their pets. Um, the what I would tell you is my personal ones. I don't have, I don't have pets on my personal ones. I just don't want dogs on furniture and you know, they're going to, they're going to do damage. Uh, the ones that we do allow them, we charge a per day per pet pet fee um, that, um, and there's usually not a problem. The, the, the problem comes sometimes um, where somebody has been there with a pet and a particularly furry pet that does a lot of shedding. The cleaning team does their very best, but, it, it doesn't get completely deferred yeah. and then somebody comes afterwards with that doesn't have a pet and there's a little bit annoying so that's my that's the big reason why I, I i i don't like to do pets unless people really want to um i just because it 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 sets me up for a potential bad customer experience or guest experience and um i try to avoid that when i can Right. And I think we've all like, I'm a huge dog lover. I'm not a fan of cats. That's just me. Right. And as long as now I don't have any dogs, I'm never going to get one because you own them. Uh, they own you. You don't own them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different thing. But I mean, no. you know, it's like, it's with all owners. If it's your child, you put up with it because it's your child. Right. Uh, if it's your right. pet, it's okay. Right. But if somebody else's, uh, you know, kind of pet hair, then you're irritated about it. You're like, what the hell? They didn't even clean. Right. And you're not going to get, <laughs> I don't care who it is, you're not going to get 100% of the hair. And it gets damn right. everywhere. Right. It, it's just kind of one of those things. What about pools? Like in Florida, now on the properties we have, we have not put pools yet. And I say that yet uh, as a caveat because we're just desperately trying to get them built quick enough to get them all up and running and then we'll come back and then maybe start putting in uh, the, you know, cocktail pools, the smaller pools, even for the duplexes. What's your feeling in Florida market specifically? Is that something that significantly uh, gets you more money or the occupancy rate goes up? Um, in Florida, um, if you are not somewhere really exotic, like literally on the beach, 
then I, I would tell you that as much as possible, get a, get something with a pool or build one in or put it in your plans to get one. Um, because um, people, when they come down here, they want to be in the water. So when they come down here in, in you know, the middle of March, they want to be able to jump in the pool. Um, it's not a it's not a complete deal killer, but I will tell you that the the houses and we have with pools rent significantly faster than without. Okay, so uh, let me ask you the question: uh, If it's a single family house in the Chicago market, right, and I have a hot tub, you think that makes a difference? Yeah, in the colder in the colder environments, hot tubs make a big difference. Um, the thing with that is you got to be you got to make sure you're on top of the service because nothing worse than hey we're going to this place it's got a hot tub and they get there and the water's cold or it's not working or so that's it's really important to have a good vendor yeah that, or it's that, dirty or it's not serviced yeah. properly that sort of thing okay got it yeah. um so as far as the um cash flow part of it right i'm buying a property uh and i mean obviously you have the air dna you have the regular sites your mashweiser has a guidance sort of a thing also and I've looked into it. I've gotten subscriptions. I've gotten off the subscriptions because I'm like, it gives you a general idea. But man, this, is there any other tool that you guys use where I know that I can plan my Airbnb perfectly? Because I don't seem to have that. And with Airbnb, it's kind of finicky that some places, it just hands down, it works. Right. And other places that would be nice places, you're like, eh, not quite performing to the level that I want. Sure. Well, AirDNA, we use AirDNA a lot sort of on the front end just to get a sense for, um, you know, what should this, how should this be doing? And then um, then once we get actually into building the listing, um, what we find is we use a couple different, uh, um, couple different dynamic pricing tools, and those do a really good job of telling you where it should be priced. They, they, they do a good job of suggesting it, especially if you rely really on their, their whole data, um, uh, complete data setup. You still have levers that you can change, you know, the, 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 the response to what their algorithm does. Um, but that's where I find is the, the really, that's where it's really good is there. Got it. And then in terms of midterms, so you have the short term, which people mm -hmm. are there for two days, two weeks, one day, eight days, whatever. Um, and then on the midterms, do you manage any of the midterm uh, midterms for people also, or you don't do that? Yes, we have a few that are midterm that are thirty days, thirty day minimums. Okay. Um, those um, those are going to be, you know, down here in Florida, they're going to be more difficult to rent. You'll you'll make less money. And they're more they're more difficult to rent. You'll stay busy maybe half the year, um, but uh, and and even that the two or three of those months are going to be you know really low rent. Got it. So in Florida, what about in the Chicago market? Do you have any midterm rentals uh, in the Chicago market? We do not. We don't have any um, that are specifically midterms. We have a few that uh, some of our ones that are a little bit more. Um, into the sub suburbs in Cary or Barrington, uh, those ones are they're offered as short term rentals, but more often we we do get you know one and two month stays. Okay, got it. Yeah, because I have a property in Barrington. I just put the town doesn't necessarily allow um, right. you know short term rentals, and sometimes some towns can be more strict than others. They're perfectly fine with uh, midterms. So when you're working with a client right? And somebody approaches you, hey, Mark, I have a couple of properties. I want to get started with this. Uh, do you require them to commit to you for a year? What does that process look like for you? No, you know what? I've been stuck in contracts that I couldn't get out of that were term contracts. So okay. one of the one of the founding things we did from the very beginning is our, our agreements are no term agreements. And um, it's really more of an engagement agreement of, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. And, um, and if we're not performing up, up the expectation, or if you're not happy with the way we're doing it, that you can, you can, um, you can end the, end the agreement. And, and right. like, that's a two way street, right? If, if, if we don't feel like we're a good match for you, uh, we may say to you, Hey, we're not a good match for you. Got it. Okay. And in terms of the cleaning fees, right? So is there kind of a rate that you charge generally on a short term rental? Does it change by the market? How does that work? No, it very much changes by the market. Um, you know, the 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 cleaning that we could get done in Chicago is half of you know we we get paid half or or 
you know, uh, two thirds of what we get, what we get charged for down here for the same cleaning. Oh, uh, really? So it's much more yeah. expensive in Florida. Yeah, it's more expensive in Florida. And, wow. and um, I was surprised at that as well. Um, but yes, it's very much market by market. And some markets, I mean, I think the most expensive market we've experienced so far is like on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, that we get charged the, just the crazy amount for, a, I mean, it's a big house, but it's still um, what I consider a crazy amount for, for cleaning. So it's very much, very much market driven. Okay, got it. And uh, what do you charge in terms of like on a on a monthly basis? And uh, do you guys collect all the revenue and then distribute that? Or do the owners collect the revenue and then pay you the management fee? Well, the, the, because we're the host, it comes through us. Okay. And, um, and so and then what we do is we we pay out um, once we, we pay out once a month at the end of the month, typically, we send them, you know, we split the revenue. Um, some are some are 25 75 20 80 somewhere in that in that vicinity um and we send the money to you by ach at the end of the month okay got it and um so i have airbnbs in the chicago market right uh, in that particular situation it's done a different little bit differently where i get all the revenue and then we split it uh, in your case uh, you send me uh, on the first of the month uh, a breakdown of this many guests. This is how many days they stayed. These are their names. This is what we collected. This is what Airbnb got. And then a, a basic itemized summary. And then in the end, hey, we got this much. You got this much. I actually, now, if it was maybe somebody different, right? Uh, with you, I had a history uh, on you and who you are. So it wouldn't be an issue. But if somebody you're managing 10, 15, 20 of these for somebody, I mean, that can be a significant amount of revenue. Right. It is, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, it can be. Yeah. Right. And so, with you doing it that way, I had no problem. Right. And I appreciate it actually because end of the month, I get a certain amount. I'm like, okay, I got this much from Mark. So I know this is my, um, you know, my, uh, let's say uh, PITI is twenty two hundred. I got thirty eight hundred bucks from you. I know exactly what the net is. So yep. in fact, in that way, I prefer that from a, a real estate standpoint. Otherwise, I have to do the numbers and I have to put in more effort, right? So, but everybody's going to be different. Anything else that uh, we missed uh, that needs to be touched upon, in your opinion? Well, I think you, you covered it pretty well. Um, we just, our, our biggest thing is we try to, we try to make it easy for you, right? We try to make, make it easy and stress-free and maximize your, your revenue. So, so that's, you know, we're, we're focused on revenue management of the short-term rental. And at the same time, like you, um, like you said, it may, I make it easy by sending the money to you once a month. Uh, we, we provide the documentation and everything that you need so that it's easy for you to look at and go, okay, I, I see it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically what that looks like is I have a property, it's up and running, I get the occupancy certificate. Uh, I'm talking about Florida because that's mm -hmm. a, it's a brand new construction, right? right. Uh, it's the same thing in Chicago, all your inspections are passed. Now at that point, if I wanna get the property furnished, right? And I'm not in the furnishing business, uh, do you have somebody you can recommend to people or do we have to do that on our own? Yes, we have we have somebody that we can recommend. It's actually my beautiful wife. She's the one that makes things look pretty. I just make them run smoothly. Okay, got <laughs> so, it. So, um, so yes, you know, together we've we've probably furnished a hundred of them at least our, ourselves um, through the years. And um, but yes, we can we can do that. We can uh, we can do the whole setup for you where we we procure everything and drop ship it at your place and set it up and find the furniture we can do that and then there's it's obviously what what we charge basically is uh is the cost of the goods plus uh plus the, just the flat fee flat fee to, to get it set up yes got it okay great so it's basically a turnkey service i'm giving you the property all ready to go everything has been checked everything is good to go and then you guys kind of take it from there including taking pictures getting it listed uh start working with the first guests start working with the cleaners so then it has really nothing to do uh, with me at that point right yep okay exactly. got it. so what about uh if if some repairs come up now let's just say hypothetically i'm in Chicago, I own a property in Florida. Now, in our case, obviously, we have a team there, uh, so it's a little different. But let's just say I don't have anybody in Florida, right? Uh, what do I do then if a repair comes up, something is broken? How do I handle that? Well, two of our, two of our key things that we uh, typically establish everywhere is a relationship with a good cleaning team 
and a relationship with a good handyman that's willing and able to respond quickly. So what we found is that that handyman usually will be able to solve 90, 95% of the problems that you're going to have at a, at a property. Um, outside of that is, you know, an HVAC problem. Um, if there's an electrical problem, that's usually a bigger, that that doesn't happen very often. Sometimes there's a plumbing issue that, you know, and there's there's good trades to find to do that. But those, those the key ones are the cleaner and the handyman. And um, some of the markets where we have a few more sort of concentrated in one place, we find somebody that we call a quality assurance person because they'll come in after the cleaner. And a lot of times they'll catch the things that maybe the cleaners didn't see and can we'll get in touch with the handyman. So it works pretty well. Got it. Okay. And uh, so basically that person is kind of the quality check, making sure everything is the way it is, because as you start scaling up, that's where these things can get missed. These things can, um, you know, kind of go sideways. Any horror stories, any problems, because you've obviously done hundreds and hundreds of these at this point, yeah. guests that have come in and out that you were like, oh my man, I mean, that was a memorable one that you've had that was maybe not the guest, guest didn't cause it. It was just one of those things that happened. Uh, anything that you can say you know, for people to be cautious of. Sure. Well, so the one thing that I would say that's always that's always tricky is is you gotta like people that want to come and have a big party at your place. Um, it's gotten less and less. We put a lot of rules. We we you know we pay attention to how do we keep our guest quality high. But I've had situations where somebody rented it, said it was going to be two people. They checked in about two hours later. They came with fourteen people. Everybody had a bedroll and a box of booze with them. Um, and so fortunately we were able to shut that one down before, before the problem, you know, happened. We just happened to, uh, to see that the, the, again, the noise monitor said, wow, gee, there's a lot of noise there. Let's look at the cameras. Camera showed us all the people. And so we were able in that, that property, we had an alarm on that we were able to say, listen, you know, we're going to set, we're going to take your alarm out. And if you, you know, if we, if you set off the alarm, you can explain to the police why you're there. Cause I'm telling you, you right. have to leave. Um, and so. That that was a that was one of our blessing lessons early on, um, you know the things that some of it is you have to kind of be able to read between the lines and pay attention to what's being said because um, guests become smart and they realize like hey if I say it's a bachelorette party nobody's gonna let me let me there right or or if um, or if it's if it's young kid younger kids right under twenty one and they're coming somewhere where they're gonna be there's gonna be a bunch of booze that's gonna be a problem. And so, um, you know, some of it is is just having an ongoing conversation with the guests and, and having paying attention to your spidey sense. I, I just, you know, there's been enough times when um, when I've said, oh, gosh, I just I had a feeling I didn't go with it. And I've learned to trust that a little bit more, too. And, that, and then and that just that comes from taking that comes from from doing a lot. You know that as well as anything. Right. Yeah. You you have a sense for no, it's a, you know um, it's like right. kids have a prom going on right and an adult and sometimes adults need more supervision than the damn kids right <laughs> kids at least know they're doing uh, you know they're getting away with something sometimes uh, irresponsible parent irresponsible adult uh, you know and then it's somebody living locally you, you know you live in chicago why are you looking for a pro i mean like those are yeah. kind of some basic things as to that should make your radar go off Right. right now, it's a business people. It's a corporation. Uh, you know, they're saying, "Hey, we got five. You know, people, guys coming in for. You know, it's a Panera or whatever. I mean, we have had a bunch of those guests where they're coming because they're here for eight days. You know, ten days, right. twenty days. You don't have to worry about it, right? No, but uh, uh, you see those better. situations where uh, you're like, "Yeah, maybe I don't need the extra five hundred bucks, right? And if money is your motivator." You're going to have problems, right? If you look at yeah. it as a business that, hey, I want a long term business and I would rather keep it vacant rather than just try to have jam people in there, I think you're going to do well. Yeah, I think so too. And I mean, the thing that we do, I know on all of our, on all of our listings, whether we do or not, we say that there's cameras and noise monitors. And so that's going to scare away a lot of people that are just coming to, you know, to, to cause problems. Got it. Makes uh, perfect sense, man. Having said that, uh, I appreciate you having uh, you being on because this is even for us. Uh, I've scaled up to I think 
15 or 18 properties here. We're obviously building a lot in Florida, you know, and at least uh, in Florida and Chicago, I need to, on both of them, I need to get uh, to about 100. So for everybody listening for Cashflow Squad, thank you very much. Share the podcast, uh, reach out to uh, Mark. Uh, we will post his details in the podcast. Uh, but just uh, real quick, Mark, how do they reach you? Do you have a website, email you want to give out? Uh, sure. So our our uh, website is plusvacationrental.com. That's rental with no S at the end, just a singular. Again, plusvacationrental.com. And you can send uh, me an email at mark, M-A-R-K, at plusvacationrental.com. Okay. And uh, plus is spelled as P-L-U-S, uh, yes. vacation rental, right? Uh, plus right. vacation rental. Uh, yep. No rules, just vacation rental, uh, dot com. Having said that, guys, thanks a bunch. Thank you, Mark, again, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you.